qualitative analysis on inorganic compounds. In this second video, we present test for an ions, the negatively charged ions. Welcome. We begin with the common reagents used to test for an ions. This first reagent is barium nitrate. Barium nitrate simply introduces barium ions into your unknown solution. So when we are provided with barium nitrate, it can be accompanied by three different instructions to the candidate. The first instruction would involve addition of two drops of barium nitrate, just plain barium nitrate. So we expect an observation of white precipitate. When we see a white precipitate on addition of two drops of barium nitrate, the learner or the student is supposed to use his or her understanding of solubility rules of salts and realize that the white precipitate is as a result of formation of insoluble barium salts. For that matter, the conclusion would be that probably the white precipitate is because of presence of the sulfate ion. This is concluded because barium sulfate is insoluble. Barium sulfite is also insoluble, so white precipitate here would probably also signify presence of sulfite ions. Again, barium carbonate is another insoluble salt of barium. And for that matter, white precipitate on addition of two drops of barium nitrate would also mean that carbonate ions are also probably present in your unknown solution. Now, the opposite of this would be no white precipitate formed. For that matter, a student is expected to conclude that these three anions are now absent if we don't see a white precipitate. We move to the next instruction concerning barium nitrate and in this instruction the candidate would be expected to add two drops of barium nitrate followed by some nitric 5 acid. When we add barium nitrate followed by nitric 5 acid we expect two sets of observations. One, there would be a white precipitate which then becomes soluble when we add acid. And two, the white precipitate would be insoluble when you add the acid. So for the first observation, a student would then be expected to conclude that it is sulfite ion that is present in their known solution if your precipitate is soluble or carbonate. If the precipitate becomes insoluble, then now we conclude sulfate is the cation present. We proceed to the third possible instruction concerning barium nitrate. The third instruction concerning barium nitrate would expect the candidate to add two drops of barium nitrate which is already acidified to the unknown solution. If we see a white precipitate, then we expect sulfate ions to be present. And the opposite, the reverse of this is true, 
to the extent that when we don't see a white precipitate, then we conclude that sulfate ions are absent. With that, we are through with barium nitrate as a reagent used to test for anions. Let's move on to the second reagent, and this is addition of lead 2 nitrate. Lead 2 nitrate introduces lead ions to our unknown solution. Now, in as far as lead 2 nitrate is concerned, we can also be given the reagent with three different instructions. The first one being addition of plain lead to nitrate. We shall add two drops of it. So if we see a white precipitate, this means that insoluble lead salts are in our solution. Probable ions include sulfate, sulfite, carbonate, and even chloride ions. Now, if we see no white precipitate as the opposite of our observation in this case, then a student is supposed to conclude that these ions are absent. The second instruction would advise the student to add two drops of lead to nitrate followed by addition of acid. Let's see what happens in such a case. So in cases where we are asked to add two drops of lead to nitrate followed by drops of nitric 5 acid, two sets of observations are possible. One, white precipitate would be formed soluble on addition of nitric 5 acid. And of course, we shall also see bubbles of a colorless gas. For that case, the conclusion would be either sulfite ions are present or carbonate ions. When our white precipitate persists or becomes insoluble, then an expected to conclude that it is sulfate or chloride. Again, when we see opposite of these observations, meaning that no white precipitate is formed, then a candidate is supposed now to conclude that these respective ions are absent from your unknown solution. We proceed to the third possible instruction, and that would advise the learner to add lead to nitrate followed by warming, some slight heating over a Bunsen flame. We also have two sets of observations. One, your white precipitate would be soluble on warming. So here we need to start thinking of a salt of lead that dissolves in warm or hot water. That is chloride. And for that matter, the, cut, the anion present would then be concluded to be chloride. If the white precipitate is insoluble on warming, then we have the other three anions, and that is sulfate, sulfite, and carbonates. Let's proceed to now a situation where the instructions are telling the candidate to add lead to nitrate, which is already acidified. For acidified lead to nitrate, if a candidate observes a white precipitate, the conclusion is that the unknown solution contains sulfide, sulfate ions sorry, or chloride ions. Otherwise, no white precipitate seen or observed would mean absence of the two. We proceed to our next reagent, which in this case would be addition of acidified potassium dichromate 6. 
So what acidified potassium dichromate 6 would do is that it would oxidize the anion present in the anion solution. The anion that is commonly oxidized is the sulfite radical to sulfate. So if we see the first observation being that acidified potassium dichromate 6 has changed from orange to green, meaning it has been reduced, and then we observe bubbles of a colorless gas. Then it would mean that sulfite ions are probably present in your unknown solution. Now, if the acidified potassium dichromate 6 remains orange, and as well bubbles are still seen, then probably it is now carbonate ions that are present in your unknown solution. We proceed to the next test in identification of anions, and this involves heating the reagent given strongly, and as we heat strongly, we also test for any gas that might be produced, obviously using moistened litmus papers. So here, the expected observations are quite many, and it is at this point when we also allow words in making some conclusions. The first expected observation when we heat is that a colorless liquid would be formed on the upper cooler parts of the test tube. For this, we will conclude that the solid provided is hydrated. Observation 2. Blue litmus paper turns red. Red, red litmus paper remains red. Here again we shall conclude that acid gas is produced. So in those two situations, we shall allow words in inferences. Let's proceed to the next. Red litmus turns blue and blue remains blue. Here we have the only alkaline gas being produced. That is ammonia, so our conclusion would be that ammonium ion is probably present. Next, we have bubbles of a colorless gas that extinguishes a burning splint. Here, we probably have carbonates which are being decomposed to carbon 4 oxide or hydrogen carbonates which also produce carbon 4 oxide. Brown fumes would be for decomposition of nitrates, so the conclusion is that nitrate ions are present. If you have a glowing splint being relit, again, this signifies nitrate because of production of oxygen. Finally, if you see a white solid formed on the upper cooler parts of the tube, white solid, this is a sublimate. So, the conclusion would be that the solid sublimes. We move to the next test, and that is adding water to your sample and shaking. So if we are advised to add water to your sample in a test tube and shake, then we expect the observation that the solid would dissolve to form a colorless solution. The conclusion would be that solid is soluble in water. A student had an option of giving a negative inference that surely because we are forming a colorless solution then copper ions which would otherwise be blue Ion 2 ions would otherwise be green, or ion 3 ions would, which would otherwise be brown, are uh, absent. We proceed to the next test where we are adding water and shaking. But we don't end there. After shaking, we go ahead and filter. So here, the most probable observation would be that the solid partially dissolves 
to form a colorless filtrate and a white residue. We will conclude that the solid provided is actually a mixture of a soluble salt and an insoluble salt. And that is why we are able to get a residue and a filtrate. Now, because we are getting colorless filtrate and a white residue, a student has an option of also telling us that copper ions, ion 2 ions, and ion 3 ions. These would be absent in both the residue and the filtrate. We lastly look at a test where the residue obtained here is transferred to a test tube using a spatula and then we go ahead and add an acid which in this case is nitric 5 acid. So if we do that instruction we would expect bubbles of a colorless gas and the solid would dissolve in the acid. For that matter your inference will be sulfite ions present or carbonate. Why we don't go for sulfate is because we have said earlier that between nitric 5 acid and sulfuric 6 acid, the sulfuric 6 acid is the less volatile acid and therefore nitric acid has no ability to displace sulfate ions. Thank you for being with us. We want to ask you to watch out for our next video where we shall now present qualitative analysis on organic compounds. But before we stop, I want to advise our learners that sometimes you may be provided with what we call hydrogen peroxide. This is usually used to oxidize ion 2 ions to ion 3 ions. So if you are told to add hydrogen peroxide to your sample and then continue to add maybe ammonium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, then we expect to now see ion 3 ions being present in your solution. So I believe you know the kind of observations that we shall make. Again, we can also give you acidified potassium manganate 7, which again can be used to oxidize ion 2 ions to ion 3 ions. We wish you all the best in your revision and at the Kenyan teacher is our YouTube handle. Kindly share and thanks for being with us.